right. So we're gonna dive right into it. Um, I have a question for us. Um, and whether you're a teenager, you're a preteen, whatever campus you on, you guys got campuses everywhere. You just started one on Neptune, way to go. Um, it's awesome. <laughs> but uh, Pastor Mike's like, that's a good idea. We probably got some people watching on YouTube from there. But here's a question for us, whether if you are a teenager, uh, whether if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever your age is, here's a question for us. Uh, what kind of people do you want to be? And I'm using you in the second person pl plural pronoun, meaning all of us. Like, like what kind of person do you want to be? Because the vision of the future transforms what you do today. Here's another part of that question is, what kind of people do you want the world to see? What kind of person do you want to be, and what do you want the world to see? Um, our world is desperately hurting, and if we're honest, we are too. Matter of fact, there should be um, a healing place for a hurting world. But what does that look like? So what I want to talk about is four ways to become a healing people. That each of us, by God's grace, is a wounded healer. So if we want to know about healing, we need to go to the healer himself. In case you don't know, his name is Jesus of Nazareth. He hails from eternity. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords, and he wants to be your friend. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus was in a conversation, and he was doing things that upset the religious establishment. He was hanging out with sinners. I mean, God forbid that the Savior hang out with sinners. Uh, matter of fact, I mean, we're family, so I'm going to go ahead and say, I sure hope you got some friends that cuss like pirates. I hope you got some lost friends that make you go, oh, Lord, they are lost. Because those are the people that need healing. And so Jesus was doing what Jesus does, and a religious establishment caught his attention. And so Jesus taught us what a healing people look like, Jesus showed us that a healing person looks like L-O-V-E, love. On the count of three, say love with me. One, two, three, love. Okay, but let me pause here. It's really important for us to understand, and teenagers, I'm talking to you, you first, and, and you younger millennials and Gen Z, I'm talking to you first. Love is not a sentimental feeling. Love is a commitment for the highest good of the other. Love is sacrificial, love is costly, love will make you bleed, love will make you put down your preferences. Love looks like the cross. So when we say I love you, do we understand what we're really saying? And so to be a healing people, it looks like love. So we're gonna look at Luke chapter 10, and Luke was written by, you ready, this is deep, so get ready to write this down, Luke. Luke was a Gonim, Luke, Luke was a Gentile. He was an other, he wasn't a Jew, he was a Gentile. He was also a doctor, so he was very analytical and logical. He says this in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29, Jesus is in a conversation with, with a religious expert. He would have been a part of what's called the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court. He would have been a, a, a professor type. He understood the Torah, the Jewish law. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him. Trying to test Jesus and win is like trying to drink the Gulf of Mexico with a straw. <laughs> Never gonna happen. Saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I love how Jesus answers back with a question, what is written in the law, what is written in the Torah? He asked him, how do you read it? The religious scholar answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So the religious scholar's correct. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four and five, the Shema, the Hebrew Shema, Shema Israel, Adonai Eleheinu, Adonai Echad. That's actually Hebrew, not tongues. Nevertheless, it was cool though. So the first, so, so the, so the, so the first part is, 
this, this response to God's grace and love, but then the second part of love is actually Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 through 19. And if you want to know what love actually is, it looks like don't glean all your fields because they're going to be immigrants and foreigners to come, so let them pick up the leftovers to show how generous God is. Like, it's very sacrificial. It's very sacrificial. As a matter of fact, if I could put it this way, when you love your neighbors, you love yourself, true freedom is not doing what you want to do. That's what an undisciplined five-year-old child does. True freedom is doing what's best for my neighbor. That's true freedom. Because you know, as us as a, I can do what I want to do. Okay, so can a three-year-old. But the Jesus that I know says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but consider others better than yourselves. Not only look out for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. Have this mind of Christ. I, okay, you, you get the point. Y'all with me? Okay. Jesus said this in verse 28. You answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. But here comes the big moment. But... On a count of three, say but with me. One, two, three, but. Okay, we family. Whenever you see but in the Bible, something big is about to happen. And God loves big butts and he cannot lie. Satan will try to deny. See, you guys are sanctified people, so you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Sir Mix-a-Lot, I'm talking about King Jesus. Seriously, whenever you see but in the Bible, something big is about to happen. Watch what the religious scholar does here. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Early in my faith, I was all judgy and stuff with this religious scholar. But then as I began to understand the history and the situatedness of the first century Second Temple Jewish world, his response made sense. So think about it. He's a Jewish scholar. He understands Jewish history. So how would you feel about non-Jews if they held your ancestors as slaves for 400 years in Egypt and they murdered your Jewish boys because they're afraid of too much population. And then, and then when God does this thing called the Exodus and the Passover and these, these incredible miracles and the children of Israel get set free and they go to the promised land, but they got to deal with more non-Jews called the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Zebubites, the Prejuvites, and probably ants that bite. And then once you get to the promised land, because you disobeyed Deuteronomy 28 through 31, you get taken into captivity by more Gentiles called the Babylonians. And then when you finally get to the promised land, again, you got the Roman Gentiles occupying you and only none Roman citizens could hang on a cross. There was no Republican, there was no Democrat, there was a emperor, and if you got out of line, you got nailed to a cross. Let me put it to you this way, I need y'all to feel the weight of this. You got lynched on a cross. You need to understand, racism is not new, and it's not an American thing, it's a demonic human thing that Jesus wants to overcome. Okay, so, in essence, the Pharisee is really going, listen here, a, a Jewish carpenter from the wrong side of the tracks in Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You from the wrong tracks, you from the wrong family, no way, you're the Hamashiach, no way, you're the Messiah. Are you telling me I'm to love non-Jews? And Jesus is like, whoop, there it is. <laughs> By the way, that's Hebrew. So healing place, how do we become a healing people? Through the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Let me pause here. Whatever God requires, he's the provision to fulfill it. Let me say it again, because this could change everything. Whatever God requires, he's the provision. 
God is not going to ask you to do something that he doesn't give you his life and power to do it. God doesn't ask you to clean yourself up. He is the cleaner. God doesn't ask you to fix yourself. He's the holy carpenter, and he has the tools of grace. He doesn't need you to try harder. He needs you to rest in him. So it's through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, here are four ways we can be a healing people. Number one, a healing people are able to see people beyond the label. They're able to see people beyond the label. Teenagers and young adults, never forget this, and for us older folks too, we will never love people beyond the label we give them. Well, that's a Democrat. Well, that's a Republican. Well, that's a this, and well, that's a that, and that. We limit our capacity to love by our labels. Why do you think Jesus says, love your neighbor? Because in everybody's our neighbor, and that's a label that says, that person is made in the image of God. Never forget this. Jesus loves the people you don't like. One of the things we say at Transformation Church is this, treat everybody like Jesus died for them because he did. And if Jesus bled for them, then they're worthy of dignity, honor, and respect. I don't have to agree with you to love you. Dignity is a given. So let's go back to the story. Jesus, the master storyteller, answers the question with a story, and he says this. Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into robbers' hands. From Jerusalem to Jericho was a 17-mile trip, and it was a 3,000-mile descent. There was an ancient historian named Josephus, and according to Josephus, this road was called the Bloody Way because people frequently got jacked and robbed and killed on that road. So Jesus, being a master teacher, is setting the scene with something they can understand. They stripped him, beat him up, fled, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And in the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. So let's set up the scene. What was a priest, a Jewish priest? The word priest comes from the Latin word, which means bridge builder. You stand before God and man. So at the temple for the Jewish people in Jerusalem, the temple is where heaven and earth met. It was worship. It was praise. It was giving. It was sacrifice. And it was confession. It was the atmosphere and the glory of God to prepare you to go into the world. The Levite, uh, he's the worship leader. So he was leading in song. So here they are. They coming down the bloody way. They're walking. Man, worship was incredible. Thank you, pastor. Thank you. Boy, the way you exegeted that text, flawless. Ooh, that was some good preaching. Wait, who is that? Now, we know he's a Jewish man because Jesus didn't identify him as a Gentile. And so they look at him, he's beaten, he's robbed, and there's no fear of being unclean because they just left the temple in Jerusalem. And so they look at him and go, wow, he really looks messed up, but let me tell you about worship. Woo, boy, man, we were singing hallelujah. We are both started da 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 And oh, it was great and it was awesome. Back, meanwhile, he's over there dead. And they just walked on by. Don't let a major problem knock on your door before you care. Listen, don't wait till it happens to people who look like you before you care. I'm sure glad Jesus didn't go, hey, Dad, Holy Spirit, these people we created, they're going to mess everything up. It ain't my problem, though. I ain't going. Ain't my problem. No, no. He, he goes, my love is the solution to the problem, and I'm going. Sometimes we as American Christians, we have individual-itis. Well, that, that, hey, that ain't my problem. Why do you think God left you here? To go, no. He left us here to be the body of Christ, to be wounded healers. So they... Walk on by. Oh boy, here comes another big butt. But a Samaritan 
OMG, family. The moment Jesus said a Samaritan, it would have went bonkers in the midst of Jews. Why? Let's do the backstory. In 722 BC, the northern 10 tribes of Israel are taken into captivity by these Gentile pagans called the Babylonians. And over the centuries, this whole new people group come into being called the Samaritans. And one, no, 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 it was, it was probably about, uh, wow. Uh, it was early on, early on, the Gentiles, the Samaritans, went into the Jewish temple. This is before G Jesus grew up, and they desecrated it with dead man's bones. That's bad. That, that would be like somebody walking in here doing something ungodly. So you had ethnic tension. You had religious tension as well. I'm sure glad we're over that. <laughs> so Jesus and his humanity family was born into a world that had a 700 year ethnic conflict that he had nothing to do with, but wanted to do everything to heal that divide through his gospel. But a Samaritan on his journey came to him, now watch this, and when he saw the man, so he too's coming from Jerusalem and he sees the man. Notice it doesn't say he sees the Jewish man who's supposed to be his enemy. He sees the man, he sees the person made in the image and likeness of God. He doesn't see a label, he sees a person that God values. And then the scripture says, and he had compassion. As a matter of fact, healing place, the way we become a healing people is not only are you able to see people, uh, to love people beyond the label you give them, but we're able to become compassionate. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him and when he saw the man, he had compassion. And teenagers and young adults, the word compassion is two words smashed together and it means to suffer with. One of the ways that you know that the grace of God is tenderizing your heart other people's pain becomes yours. Not in an unhealthy way, but in a way that says, maybe I can help. Maybe I can be God's grace. Maybe I can, and so he's walking by and he has compassion. It moves his heart. Let me ask us this, and, and, and I think I know the answer, but, but I just wanna make sure for all the campuses, and, and maybe there's some guests, and some of us need to be challenged, but I wonder if we prayed as hard for hurting people as we do for the bills to get paid, what would happen in our world? I, I just, I just, I just wonder if, if we woke up in the morning and said, God, there's a hurting people in this world. I know you're gonna take care of me because Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and all in his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you, not our greeds, but our needs will be met. I just wonder if we said, God, you're gonna take care of me. Who in the world needs compassion today? Teenagers, in your schools, who are the kids that sit alone by themselves all the time? Maybe you could be the one who stops the, lad, the next shooting. Maybe you could be the one by reaching out and loving. And then for some of us, you're like, oh, that boss, this boss of mine, he's just this and this and this. Instead of complaining, and start praying. What is their trauma? What is their pain? What is their hurt? Hurt people, hurt people. Good, Compassionate. Good. You're able to not only see beyond the label, not only become compassionate, but also sacrificial. Luke 10, 34. Watch this now. He went over to him and bandaged him. He was not afraid of his pain. He was not afraid of his wounds. He was not afraid, and by the way, bandages cost money. It goes on. Pouring olive oil and wine. Young adults, olive oil was to keep the wound moist, 
And wine with alcohol in it was to kill the infection. So bye-bye grape juice theology. <laughs> Let's pour some sugar on the, no. It was alcohol to kill the infection. Olive oil costs money. The wine costs money. The bandages cost money. He was just coming from Jerusalem and he's spending money. Then he put him on his own animal. His animal costs money. Brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now keep in mind, this Jewish man was the enemy of the Samaritan. It reminds me of somebody who once said, but I tell you, love your enemies. Yes. Yes. Well, I felt something. Let me park here. So if I was to go to your Facebook page, am I going to see some loving, some enemies? Because the scripture does say you will know my disciples because they argue on Facebook. <laughs> I hope you guys know in the 2020 election, 50% of the Facebook ads that pitted Republicans against Democrats was from Russia. Uh, we have a former high-ranking FBI official that's a part of our staff now at Transformation Church, and I've been saying this for a few years ago, yeah, you're 100% right, we knew it. So we're repackaging things to cause division because of politics. How, you know what, last I checked, Jesus was an elephant, no? Jesus was a donkey. Now, he rode a donkey, but he wasn't a donkey. He describes himself as the lamb of God. So the church is to be prophetic to elephants and donkeys because we worship the lamb. Okay, okay. I know, I know. Send all your emails to Pastor Mike and Ra Rachel. They're going on sabbatical. They'll read them when they get back. Verse 35. The next day, he took out two denarii. You know how much two denarii is? Like two and a half months of living expenses for this enemy. And gave him to the innkeeper and said this, take care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Now, this isn't in the text, but I think I'm standing on solid biblical ground with application. It cost him money, but what else did it cost him? What about when the Samaritan man went back home to Samaria? You know, and his family was there, the rest of the Samaritans. And uh, let's just name him, uh, let's name him Jason. So Jason comes back, hey honey, how you doing? The little kids, Jason Jr., Jasonette. And, um, <laughs> Cousins are there, family's there, it's wide open. And how was your trip to Jerusalem? Oh, it was great, he shares. And he goes, and by the way, I seen this guy. Man, he was beat bad. I thought he was dead, but when I got close, y'all catch that? But when I got close, yeah. proximity breeds intimacy. Intimacy is into yeah. me, you see. So when he got close, he was still alive. And so he did all these things and he tells them about the bandages, the olive oil, the wine, the animal, the inn. And they're like, well, what Samaritan was it? What Samaritan was it? He goes, it wasn't a Samaritan. It was a Jewish guy. And they're going, oh, you're one of those Jewish guys, Jewish lives matter guy, huh? <laughs> oh, you're one of those guys. Oh, so you woke now, huh? You've been reading CRT, critical race theory now, huh? Oh man, how could you do that? Don't you know they are our enemies? Don't you know they hate us? Don't you know? And he's like, all of that may be true, but that don't mean I gotta give hate back for hate. So he probably lost some friends. I would imagine for some of you African Americans that are part of this wonderful church, you've probably been told, well, why are you going to that blank church? Don't you know he's white? You're like, well, yeah, I think so, yeah. I mean, he did, he did play basketball. And then I'm sure with some of our white brothers and sisters and everybody like, man, are you going to that church with 
with those pe- 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 people? You mean the people that Jesus died for that are made in his image? Yeah. For some of us, it's, it's been a great cost. But whatever the cost, Jesus is going to give back many, many, many times over. You see, through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, a healing people are able to see people beyond a label. A healing people are compassionate. A healing people are sacrificial. And then lastly, a healing people are merciful. Are merciful. Um, Before I dive into the text, I want to ask you a question. And this isn't for everybody, but this is for those of us who've said, I follow Jesus. And if you haven't followed Jesus yet, in a moment, you're going to have an opportunity to do so. But but I want to talk to those of us who have followed Jesus. and, And I want to ask you this. Do you still remember the first time his eyes of mercy caught your eyes? Do you still remember when you couldn't believe that Jesus would love somebody like you? Do you still remember when all you could talk about is, oh God, let me tell you about amazing grace. Do you still remember who you used to be until you met Jesus? Do you still remember his mercy? Do you still remember the first time you drank a cold glass of his love and it filled you up? Do you still remember? Because when you remember his mercy, you become merciful. And we need people that understand mercy. The text says this, which of these three do you think posed to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers and the religious scholar is trapped, but in being trapped, he's actually set free. The one who showed mercy to him, then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Um, I want to walk you through two things, and then I'm going to finish with the truest of the truest part of this story. So at Transformation Church, we we have a big idea. It's called the soul tattoo. What's the tattoo on my soul to take away from from this? Number, Number one is this. You were healed to be a wounded healer. Listen now. Healing Place Church, all the campuses. The Lord Jesus healed you and is healing you to be a wounded healer. And it is your wounds that are going to attract other people. Your scars are a testimony. For some of us in here, you have scars from cutting. Well, I want to let you know Jesus has scars too. And in his scars is your healing. Here's our action step. If possible... Uh, I want you to get my book, How to Heal Our Racial Divide. I basically preach to you one page out of this book. And I want to encourage you to, to, to get it. If you can't afford the book, I'm putting this one right here for anybody who wants to get it. There is no shame. It's yours. It's free. There's some at the bookstore. And you can go online to buy them, Amazon, wherever it is that you do. I want to encourage you to do that. It would be a great summertime read. And this is really important. All proceeds go to needy children. My own. They're expensive, y'all. I'm like, Lord, have mercy. God bless you, brother. Thank you. So, so, okay. All right, so I would be like the worst preacher in the world if I didn't finish with the truest of the true part of this story. Here's the deal. You and I are the Jewish man on the side of the road. Here's the deal. The Bible says that all of us are born spiritually dead. 
and every one of us have sinned. The devil has stripped us of our dignity. If, if we were to have a highlight tape of the things that we did, done, many of us would be incredibly ashamed and I would be leading the way. Dignity has been stripped. Some of us have gone through incredible abuse, incredible trauma, even now with addictions and all these things. But here's the problem though. You and I are on the side of the road and we keep trying to get up. Don't get up. Don't get up. Don't get up. And here's why. Because there's not a good Samaritan coming from Jerusalem. There's a good God who came from heaven. And this good God, his name is Jesus, and he is not going to pass you by. He is walking by. There's mercy in his eyes. There's grace in his hands. There's healing in his heart. And he's saying, don't get up. I'll pick you up. I'll carry you. Bring your addictions. Bring your pain. Bring your shame. Bring whatever it is to him. His arms are strong enough. His shoulders are broad enough. There is no sin too great. There is no mountain too high. No valley too deep. His his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. And guess what he wants to do? Guess what he wants to do, family? He wants to take the linen cloth that was on him in that tomb and he wants to wrap up your wounds. He wants to wrap up the molestation. He wants to wrap up feeling neglected. He will wrap it all up and he's not done yet. He's not done yet. You know what else he's gonna do? He ain't gonna pour oil on you. He's gonna pour the Holy Spirit on you. He's gonna pour the Spirit of God on you and he's not done. He is not done. He says, next, next. I don't have wine, I got blood. Oh, something happens to me when I think about the blood. Can I tell you about the blood just for a minute? Can I tell you about the blood just for a minute? The blood is all powerful to heal a marriage. The blood is all powerful to break chains. You know, you, you know what else the blood will, will do? It'll take a person like me who grew up a compulsive stutterer preaching at healing place. You know what the blood of Jesus will do? It'll take a little boy who barely got into college and turned him into a New Testament scholar. Let me tell you about the blood. One more, one more, one more, one <laughs> more. The first wedding I went to was my own at 21 and we just celebrated 30 years of marriage. Let me tell you about the blood. So he wants to pour the blood over us. Oh, but he's not done, family. He ain't gonna put you on a donkey. He says, get on my back. I'm gonna yeah. carry you. Yeah. I'm gonna carry you. Yeah. And then he's like, I'm gonna go away for a while, but I ain't gonna leave you alone because the Holy Spirit's gonna be inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't have an end for his family. He says, my father has a mansion with many rooms in it. And if it wasn't true, I wouldn't have said it. And guess what? Your room in the mansion has already been paid for. He didn't use cryptocurrency. He didn't use Bitcoin. He didn't use a Russian ruble. He didn't use an American dollar. He used his precious blood. That's the true of the true story.